Good morning, congregation, and welcome again to this Lord's Day service, this time for the uh, Sunday of the 19th of August 2012, where we will be looking at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. However, before we do that, let's come to God, our Heavenly Father, in prayer. Let us pray. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and eternal God, we ask thee to be present with us this morning, both in the preaching and in the hearing of the word. And as it pleased you to be with us in your presence and power last week, we would ask thee to do so the same this week. We pray for thy word, O Lord, to bless all who hear, and that you will be pleased to use it for the conversion of those who are in darkness, that they may see a great light. And this we ask for that name, which is over all in earth and heaven adored, the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to be looking at uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, and I think the best thing for me to do, therefore, is to read uh, that passage so that we have uh, we will have an idea of exactly uh, what it is that I want to say. We've already had a number of sermons on the first two chapters, and uh, this is uh, to follow those uh, sermons already. So Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, followed by the end of the Acts of the Apostles, uh, Acts chapter 28, verses 17 to 31. Acts 2, verses 42 to 47. And they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And then from the end, the last part of the Acts of the Apostles, the last chapter in fact, Acts chapter 28, verses 17 to 31. And it came to pass that after three days Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, Though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had aught to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you, to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him in, into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed and gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent 
unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed, and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. For Lord, we ask for a blessing upon thy word, that it may be a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. For we ask these things in and through the person and work of thy Son. Now I'm going to be speaking this morning on uh, the Acts chapter 2 passage, Acts 2 verses 42-47. But the uh, passage at the end of the Acts of the Apostles sheds some light on the lessons that I would uh, bring out of this by the help of the Lord. Now we see in the uh, Acts chapter 2 passage, we see the founding of the post-ascension phase of the church. The church as it is to exist after the ascension into heaven of the risen or resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Now we saw that in Acts chapter 1 and verse 9. We saw how the Holy Ghost had come down in Acts chapter 2 upon the apostles and all of the 120 disciples gathered in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And we saw how when Peter with the other apostles had lifted up his voice and begun to preach, that up to about 3,000 souls were added to the church. Firstly then, let us see what the church is. And what I want to look at this morning is really what the church is in its post-ascension of Jesus Christ phase. Of course, the church, in a very real sense, begins with Abraham, doesn't it? Or if not before, I mean, Noah was part of the church, wasn't he? He was part of the elect of God, who will be with God in heaven. So uh, the church goes right the way back to Abraham and before, where we see saints of the Most High God right from the beginning, who are our examples of faith. But Abraham in particular is set forth as our exemplar of faith for us to emulate, for us to follow. The object of faith, of course, being Jehovah himself, that is, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So firstly, then, let us see what the church is. Now, I'm not going to go into the Greek or Hebrew, because uh, most of us don't know Greek or Hebrew. So I'm simply going to ex explicate or explain in modern English, fairly simple modern English, because I think that's the best way to go about it. Now, the word church means an assembly. It doesn't mean a building. It means a gathering. It means a congregation organised, uh, either into a service or into a community, however loosely, to fulfil some task. In this case, its task is the worship and service of that person whom had been made Lord and Christ. In other words, Jesus. The church can be such a group as gathered together as one, or as gathered together in several gatherings, or the church can simply be that gathering dispersed, since we cannot always be assembled as one, or indeed as several congregations. We usually distinguish this church this gathering, this congregation, this assembly, whether gathered or dispersed, we usually distinguished this church as seen by men when physically come together. From the one that is known to God, whether or not gathered together. For God alone reads the thoughts and the minds and the hearts of everyone who professes to believe in him. Look at Revelation 2 and verse 23. We usually call the one, the visible church, as known to men. And the other, we call the invisible church, for it is known only to the invisible God. 
we see this distinction between the visible and the invisible church especially clearly in the letters addressed to the angels of the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea, Revelation 1 and verse 11. In these churches, in these visible churches, seen by men, everyone is addressed. That is the church as professed and gathered and as known to man's visible eyes. However, only those who overcome will be admitted into the eternal presence of God Most High. Revelation 2 and verse 17. That is the church as known to the invisible God. And that is the church which can never fall away. So we have to think of the church in two aspects, the visible church as seen by men and the invisible church as known to the invisible God. And it's the invisible church, the church as known to God, which could never fall away. John chapter 2 and verses 39 where Jesus says that those that the Father has given him he will lose none. So we need to be aware, first of all, of this distinction in the meaning of the word church. Secondly, let us note upon whom this church is built. We have already said that it is a group of folk tasked with both the worship and service of Jesus whom the Lord God Almighty has made both Lord and Christ. At this stage it was made up only of Jews, and no Jew could be committed to the worship and service of any one or anything less than Jehovah. The implication is as clear as it is irresistible that this Jesus whom they had taken and by wicked hands had slain and crucified, has been made both Lord and Christ by God his Father. Acts 2, 23 and 36. In other words, this Jesus whom they had slain, but is now risen from the dead and ascended into heaven, is the object of all their hope and all their trust and faith. They're putting faith and hope and trust in this Jesus as they would to God. An object here is something outside of us and real to which we look to for help and salvation. An object here, the object of our faith, Jesus, is opposite us, the subject. We are the subject, he is the object. He is the object of our faith. No Jew could look to anyone or anything for salvation, ultimately, especially one ascended into heaven. No Jew could look to anyone ultimately for salvation, but for Jehovah himself. Therefore, Jesus is both Jehovah and Jehovah the Son. Jehovah is the Trinity. Jehovah exists as Father, Son and Holy Ghost. And Jehovah the Son, Jesus, is as much Jehovah as the Father. Jehovah is the name of God, by which God was made known to Israel under the Old Covenant. And Jesus is put on a par with Jehovah. He must be, because the people who are serving him and worshipping him are all Jews. Jesus himself had said to the Pharisees, when questioned about where he came from, that Abraham had rejoiced to see his day, he had seen it and was glad. Acts, uh, sorry, John 8 and verse 56. Jesus had also told his apostles in John 14 and verse 1. He said to his uh, apostles, you believe in God? You believe in God? 
and so you should. Believe also in me. He has just put himself on a par with God in the hope and trust of his followers. Why? The reason is obvious. He is God. He is the second person of the one undivided Godhead who has, however, come down to us as men. So the post-ascension church on the very day when the Holy Ghost came down looked to Jesus of Nazareth as the one exalted evidently as both Lord and Christ, as the source of their hope. The post-ascension church is built on that faith, that kind of faith in him as Jesus, not merely a man, but the Son of God. And uh, in Jewish idiom, the word Son of God means God the Son. Jesus had earlier asked his followers, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Matthew 16 and verse 13, to which Peter had answered in uh, Matthew 16 and verse 16, Thou art, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That was the very realisation that had now come to the 3,000 converts on the day of Pentecost. They realised that the one whom they had rejected through their leaders was the very son of the living God. In other words, he was God himself. For God exists as Father, Son and Holy Ghost. That is why they repented. That is why they were baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. And that is why they joined themselves too and became part of the church or congregation of disciples. But note that when Peter stood up with the eleven and lifted up his voice, he did not preach himself any more than Paul would later do. He preached Jesus of Nazareth just as much earlier Flesh and, bl and blood had not revealed that to him, but my father, Jesus' father, who is in heaven. Peter preached what had been revealed to him by Jesus' father in heaven. On the day of Pentecost, the church was built up not on faith in Peter, any more than it would be later built up upon faith in Paul, but on the faith in Jesus, which Peter had earlier had, and which Peter and all the apostles now shared and proclaimed with the Jews. Jesus had earlier said to Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, the church on the day of Pentecost was not being built on Peter. It was being built on Jesus, whom God had made both Lord and Christ, and into whom we are to be baptised for the remission of sins. It is Jesus Christ who is the rock, the chief foundation, the object of our faith. You believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus said. The name into which we are to be baptised. We're to be baptised in the name of Jesus upon which the church is to be built. As Paul was later to say, we preach not ourselves, but Christ. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5. Because we as the church are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief corner stone or rock. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock Christ is referring to himself. We are built on the rock of Christ, to which faith Peter confessed. 
Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 when you have a moment. We need now to look more closely at the nature of the post-ascension church or community. For it is the beginning of the church as we have come to know it, between our Lord's ascension and his coming again. A church which began among the Jews is very much presently and until the end to be made up of non-Jews. So that's the reason really why I read Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 28. You see in Acts chapter 2 the church is made up entirely of Jews, possibly of proselytes. But by Acts chapter 28, the Jews depart reasoning, and Paul says that the word of God will be sent to the Gentiles, and they shall hear. So the church at its beginning, in its new phase, is made up of Jews, and then it's going to be made up of Gentiles. And the church as we understand it today is made up very largely of Gentiles. There's very few Jews who are members of the church. Don't forget the Jews are a, are a nationality, not a religion. They're a nationality with religious boundaries, but they're a, na uh, they're a race, they're an, uh, a nation. They're a group of people descended from a common ancestor, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And the Jews, to a large extent, are outside of the church, although there are Jews who are Christians. There are Jewish, Christian or Messianic Jewish churches within the state of Israel today. So the Jews are largely, in contrast to Acts chapter 2, the Jews are largely outside of the faith. But that is going to change. That is going to change. Before the end, when Jesus Christ returns in great power and glory, Israel, by Israel I don't mean the state of Israel, I mean the Jews everywhere. Israel is going to be converted wholesale to the Messiah whom they once rejected. Remember the question the apostles put to our risen Saviour just before he ascended in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6. This is the question they put to Jesus. They said, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom of God to Israel? That had been the question of the apostles to the Lord just before he was ascended. He did not deny that it was to happen. Indeed, he implied that it would. He simply said to them, It is not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has put under his own authority. But he didn't deny that the kingdom would once again come to Israel. This coming again of Israel that is, the nation of the Jews, not the state of Israel, the nation of the Jews, wherever they are. This coming again of Israel into the fold of heaven is something foretold in the Old Testament, and it is expressly implied in the New Testament as well. Paul tells us in Romans 11 and verse 25 that blindness in part, in large part, has come to Jacob, but only until the fullness of the Gentiles, the ethnics, the nations, has come in. On the day of Pentecost, the post-ascension church is made up very largely or entirely of Jews from every nation under heaven. Acts 2 and verse 5. Jews whom the Lord our God shall call. Acts 2 and verse 39. This is as if to foretoken what is about to happen. The gospel is about to be sent to the ethnics, that is to the nations. It is about to go and it is about to be received and it is about to be embraced and joined in by those outside the covenant of Israel, by those outside the chosen race, whilst the chosen race itself, to whom belong the covenants, 
and the fathers, the chosen race itself very largely, is to be confounded and for a time rejected, cast aside. Paul tells us that his heart's desire and prayer, prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved and that he could wish himself accursed for their sake. But nonetheless, as we look, as we go through Acts, we will see the terrible tragedy of Israel. The end of the Acts of the Apostles alludes to this. Paul didn't cease to preach to his own people. When bound in Rome with a chain under house arrest, he there called not the leaders of the church, but the chiefs of the Jews together, and related to them that for the hope of Israel, that is, for the Messiah's cause, he was bound with this chain. Having expounded to them from the law of Moses, that is, from the Old Testament, the kingdom of God and the things concerning Jesus, some of these chiefs of the Jews believed, and some believed not. The kingdom of God is not at this time to be restored to Israel. Instead, Paul tells us, it is to be sent unto the Gentiles, and they, the Gentiles, will hear it. Whereas the Jews won't. The Jews will reject it. This is what we see foretokened, I believe, on the day of Pentecost, with the beginning of the post-ascension church, the church in its phase after the ascension of Christ into heaven, the church that we know and that we are very familiar today in this hour of the application of God's redemption. Throughout the first century, throughout the first century New Testament, we see this great change, the rejection of Israel, the adoption of the Gentiles taking place by the time of the writings of the post-New Testament sub-apostolic fathers such as Barnabas, Ignatius, Polycar Polycarp and Clement. The churches have become very largely Gentile except for those in Mesopotamia which were largely Jewish in custom and nationality until the end of the 5th century. The rejection of Israel. Israel cast aside. Israel lost. What a mystery. What a tragedy. The chosen race rejected and lost. And Israel's been like that for nearly 2,000 years. Even Paul refers to it quite early in 55 AD in his Roman epistle. As we have said, he says, if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, in other words, the rejection of Israel is the proclaiming of the gospel to the Gentiles, what shall be the re-receiving of them, but the culmination of all things, and the resurrection of the dead? Look at Romans chapter 11 and verse 15. So, thirdly and briefly, the characteristics or things which mark or note or distinguish the post-ascension or New Testament Church. What are the things that mark the New Testament Church? It's quite different to the Jewish Church of the Old Testament. But we're in a transitional phase where the one is becoming the other. And the Old Testament Church, in its outward symbols and notes, is about to be destroyed. Let us note, therefore, the marks of the New Testament Church of God. Firstly, the members. 
They were men and women who had gladly received his word, Peter's word and the word of God through Peter. They were men and women who had gladly received his word and were baptised. This shows admission into the church as seen and noted by men. This is the visible church as seen and held by men. The visible church, they receive the word and are baptised, and they do so with gladness and joy. But remember that it is only the Lord who searches the minds and hearts, and it is only the Lord God Almighty who knows the true church invisible. Look at Revelation 2 and verse 23. Some of these may be in, some of the invisible church may be in visible churches, seen of men, and some of them may not. Nevertheless, the Lord knows those who are his, and that everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Look at 2 Timothy verses 2 and verse 19. Secondly, they weren't simply men and women who had gladly received the word and were baptised, but they continued steadfastly in several things. Namely, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching or doctrine about Jesus. What a message that was. We looked at it last week, didn't we? What a, what a harsh message. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching what the apostles had said. And what had the apostles said? They told the Jews that they had rejected, slain and crucified Jesus, whom God had raised up and made Lord and Christ. What a message. And they continued in fellowship in the same doctrine. They continued in fellowship in the Lord's Supper which is all about bread and wine, and it's all about the rejection of the Christ, whose body is broken, and whose blood is shed. Every time they partook of the Lord's Supper, they were reminding themselves of the death, the crucifixion, and the slaying of Jesus, who claimed to be the Messiah, and was rejected by their leaders because of that claim. And note, thirdly, that they did all this with one accord, and they did it daily. They did it openly. And they did it in, of all places, the temple, the very heart of the national system which had been set up by God but which had crucified and slain Jesus, the one who had been sent to it. Well, this needed quite some resolution. This needed quite some steadfastness. From a secretive, timid huddle in a private room, to openness publicly, in, as it were, the very jaws of the lion's den. The system which had been set up to receive the Messiah, the temple. The system which had been set up to illustrate the Messiah, the temple. That system was against him when he came. It had crucified and it had slain him, but God had raised him up. And they celebrated that in the midst of the temple that had rejected him and still rejected him. There's the New Testament church in the midst of its enemy, the Old Testament church. The Old Testament church in its notes or notitia had become the true church's enemy. Yet they had favour with the people. Fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done. The rejecting authorities, Ananias, Caiaphas, the high priests, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, and numerous priests, 
could do nothing about it except behold what was happening in their midst. As Jesus had said to Peter, I, the rejected one, will build my church and the gates and powers of hell shall not prevail against it. Let us pray that the visible church will not become an enemy of God's true church. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Not